Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday service. If you don't know Chaitanya or myself, Chandrika, it's our joy to share Sunday service with you. And to anyone who is new today, welcome. This topic, the inner kingdom, there's a lot of sage advice that we receive from the great ones. They say mysterious things like the kingdom of God is within you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Just behind the darkness of closed eyes shines the light of God. And as devotees, we get to figure out the mystery of this inner kingdom. And it's very interesting because it's this push-pull that we receive. We try to go within, we practice our meditations. As Krishna told Arjuna, be thou a yogi. And he says, steadfast, a lamp burns, sheltered from the wind. Steadfastly meditating, solitary, such is the likeness of a yogi's mind. Shut from sense storms and burning bright to heaven burning bright to heaven. Sandy read these words, but they're worth repeating because if your own meditation is described as the way Krishna describes it, wonderful, continue on. If your meditation, however, does not seem to be burning bright to heaven, well, don't despair, just keep trying. That's part of the process. Is nothing is ever lost on the spiritual path. All of our efforts are blessed, but we do need to continue on. And so be steadfast. Practice the inward awareness. And if we're not successful, one of the things that happens, as was also read in the readings, is we seek distractions. Lord knows there's an awful lot of distractions out there in life. And I know I do have fallen into the idea that I've put out all this effort and it doesn't seem to pay off, whether it's in meditation or some other aspect of life. And I just need a change of pace. I need a break. And so we look for distractions. You know, it might be a movie. It might be sports. Go Warriors, by the way. Any Warriors fans? Oh, there's a Warriors fans out there, okay. <laughs> it's about all I know about sports today. But anyways, there's all sorts of wonderful ways to distract ourselves. The shopping network, 24 hours on cable. You know, so choose the one that you like the most. But the fact is, it's very, very easy to distract ourselves. Even sometimes in the midst of meditation. Remember a story that Joe Tish tells, and he was meditating deeply, and then he started to get distracted. He kept hearing this really loud, obnoxious noise. And he started to, you know, go outward from the spine into the outward world, trying to figure out what this noise was. Turns out the noise was the sound of his eyelashes rubbing against his, you know, each other ever so slightly in his meditation. Have you ever noticed the sound of your eyelashes? <laughs> I just love that story because it's like, okay, that's really still if that's the noise that distracts you from your meditation as compared to all the other things that can happen. But the spiritual path, as we know, is a balance between the inner and outward world. In other words, inwardly, we try to make contact with the divine. We go within and we, be, we try to be still. We try to feel the presence of God. And then we take that presence, whatever we perceive of it, and we go forth into the world doing the various things that we need to do. We all have responsibilities. The trick is to try to hold on to that God contact and then move through the world and our duties, maintaining that balance. And sometimes we're successful at that. Sometimes a dear friend will walk up to you like they did to me this week. And we were um, in the preparation of trying to do all sorts of things for the yard sale. And by the way, congratulations. It was a wonderful success. So thank you all for those of you that donated things or purchased things. It was wonderful. And more continues in the yoga room afterwards. We set aside some special things for Ananda members. So if you have a moment, step by there. But in the midst of this, 
Of course, there's always the normal things that go on at the church. Um, and so I found myself getting push-pulled in a lot of different ways. And I was doing my best, but we had this pact that we would keep checking in with each other. And so, you know, how are you doing? And uh, how are you doing? And she asked me that. And I knew that, you know, I hadn't really checked in internally with how I was doing. <laughs> Honestly, I hadn't. And um, when I, I said, oh, fine, I kind of rolled my eyes because I knew that wasn't completely true. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay. And then she sweetly looked at me and she says, well, you seem a little wound up. <laughs> a little wound up. And I, when, that, when she said that, this image came to me. Um, and you guys have all seen them, the little uh, mechanical monkeys, and they're wearing those cute little band outfits with the gold braid and the little hat. And they have the, the, <laughs> the big clappers, you know? And they're doing this with the symbols. And if you have a um, sophisticated one, they also have lights now. And so the light shines through their eyes and blinks at you. And of course, what happens is they're clapping away and their eyes are blinking and they're spinning around faster and faster and faster. And I had that image in my mind. I said, well, that is wound up. I'm just a little off kilter, <laughs> just a little off kilter. But we all have the experience of being wound up and we know what it's like. And so here we are trying to figure out how to go back to the stillness that is God, how to find peace and tranquility, how to really hold on to that experience. And as we know, it is not an easy thing to do. Life often, often leaves us fearful, confused, in doubt. And all you need to do is look around the world at all. If you go anywhere near a news station or if you hear people talking, you will hear of tragedies that occur all the time in this world. And they can get you down. They can, if you tune into that level, be quite discouraging. There's a story from ancient India, and it's about this concept, particularly of fear. And in this village, a demon came, and the demon killed three of the villagers. And the villagers, of course, were just outraged by this and fearful of this, and so they went and they petitioned a holy man who lived just outside the village. And they said to the holy man, please, sir, can you protect us from this demon? And the holy man meditated for a while on that request and then said, yes, I can give you my protection. And so he had an audience with the demon. And he says, you know, I understand that you killed three of these villagers. The demon, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, well, you know, I've taken them now under my protection. So I ask for your word that you will leave them be. And the demon thought about it a while, kind of judged the quality of this holy man, you know, can he really protect these people? And then he said, okay, I'll leave them alone. You requested it, I will leave them be. Well, a week later, the remainder of the village, villagers swarmed to the holy man because in that intervening week, another hundred of the villagers had died. And of course, they were horrified at this situation. And the sadhu was a bit surprised at this, wondering what had gone on. And so he called and had another audience with the demon and said, hey, you gave me your word that you would not harm these people. He goes, holy sir, holy sir, I promise I did not. I killed the first three. The remaining 100 died from fear of me. From fear. And so they draw upon themselves the thing that they feared. And so we need to be aware of the fact of where do we put our attention? Do we go to the inner kingdom? Or do we live on the surface of the different emotions? This world is duality. Things happen, horrible things. And yet, the best way to combat those is to look at ourselves. Um, Sister Gianna Mata, in the wonderful book, God Alone, I'm smiling at Jayanti because she spoke about Gianna Mata in the purification ceremony today. But one of the things she talks about is the fact that our spiritual life is fought in the cold, hard light of day. 
the reality that we face day in, day out, whether in our own lives directly, because tragedy sometimes strikes directly to us, or in the world in general. In the cold, hard light of day is where we need to learn to practice our spiritual practices, to grab a hold of God and Guru, to grab a hold of the inner peace and to stay there and to fight for it. And then, when we connect with it, share it with the world. Offer your peace and your tranquility and your joy and your understanding of those higher qualities out to the world to use as an antidote to all the other things that are happening around. And of course, there's wonderful things that happen around as well. Look for those, tune into those. You know, it's really easy to be able to get caught up in other things. And the other day I was using a distraction. I learned how to use YouTube. I'd never have, for years I'd never looked at YouTube, but recently I have. And I got a hold and I was like, oh, there's one about this little animal. And it was a, a leopard and it was a, a mechanical leopard, and it was in London, on the streets of London, and I guess they were raising awareness for the habitat of the leopard, some cause along that line. And it was sitting on um, one of the bridges that I guess is the main thoroughfare, walking thoroughfare um, into the city. And it was really interesting because the people who were paying attention and perhaps this is a spiritual lesson for us as well, but the people who were paying attention to their surroundings spotted the leopard, and you know, from a distance it looked pretty real, and so that you could you know, do a double take and go, huh, and then they tuned in to do it was mechanical. And so you know, they smiled at it and walked along. Well, those of us who were really, really distracted, you know, they were playing with their cell phones or listening to music or, you know, whatever they might be doing, they were not paying attention to the surroundings around them. And so when they walked past the leopard, the leopard growled at them. <laughs> and, you know, so it was just this hilarious little um, venue where people are, you know, doing whatever they're doing, and the next thing you know, the leopard growls, and inevitably, whoever was not paying attention would jump or scream or fall or, you know, I mean, they were just so startled by this experience. And some of them would then look for witnesses. Did you see that? Did you see that? You know, and their hearts going like this. And eventually they realized they were pranked. But I mean, that's partly what happens to us. How many times in life are we pranked? Either knowingly or unknowingly? You know, sometimes we just go through life and nobody's intending to prank us. But because we're not really paying attention, Woo, you're the one who's leaping up and being alarmed. And it's like, all right, where do you do then? Pay attention, go back. So sometimes the distractions, I guess you could say, are instructive in and of themselves, but you have to remember that life is a lesson in applying our spiritual truths. And when we look to the world around us, Gyana Mata shares some wonderful, wonderful advice. Because it's very easy to say, well, I would be peaceful if I wasn't getting push-pulled in six different ways, if I could just do one thing at a time. But what she says, change no circumstances, change me. Change me. That means we get to do all the inner work to look at our attitudes, to see where our attention is, to be, figure out, are we in tune with divine at this second, in this moment? I was 10 seconds ago, how am I doing now? We don't know. But we have to change ourselves inwardly. And so at last we get to this concept of, well, how do we do that? Well, the masters promise us that even a little practice of inward communion with the Lord will free us from dire fears and colossal sufferings. You've heard that, that message time and time again in the Festival of Light that we'll have in a few minutes. We make that promise, the masters promise us that. Free us from dire fears and colossal sufferings. Sign me up, <laughs> I want that. I don't want the fears and the colossal sufferings. I want to live in the God's joy and the peace within. And so the secret of happiness is learning how to live in that inner tranquility, of learning how not to um, fall exhausted from the surface emotions. You know how when you get your emotions you know, really, really riled, eventually you just get exhausted. 
You know, it's like the little clapping monkey. Eventually, it runs out of steam, and it just plunk. Wherever it does, his arms will fall down, and his head stops, and the noise stops, and the light stops. It's just exhausted. Well, that's not real peace. That's not real inner tranquility. But by going within and contacting the divine within, we start to perceive the true inner tranquility. The rest of the emotion swirling around the world, and we rest in peace. Now, this is an ongoing thing. One of the reasons I was reading God alone is because sometimes in the world we think that we're the only ones that are going through trials and tribulations. You know, it's us, our generation, whatever. And then you read a book that was from a previous generation and you hear the questions that they're asking um, Sister Guiana Mata because she corresponded with a lot of the nuns and truth seekers. And they would propose their concerns or their challenges with living the spiritual life. And some of these uh, letters that were written were during the various wars, world wars, big things, really big things. And we forget, even those of us that live perhaps during that time, forget the challenges sometimes that we face, because now it's this moment and whatever challenge we have. But she still gave him the same wonderful spiritual advice, is to go within, contact God, and ask God to change you. The world, interestingly, doesn't change all that much. I remember once I went on seclusion for like a month, and before I went on seclusion, um, if you glanced at a newspaper or whatever, you would hear various things, you know, like, oh, another shooting in Chicago, or whatever. And I came back from that month-long seclusion, and I was all, you know, happy and blissful and peaceful. And when I tuned into the news, guess what was happening? <laughs> yep, same thing. And it's like, wow, did any time happen in between there? And of course, that's part of the duality of the world, is that there are things that happen. So, go inward. Now, in this mysterious aspect that is called the inner kingdom, the time and ages we've fought with the idea of what is the most spiritually powerful thing to do. And in the 10th century, a, an individual who was living in a monastery was trying to live a spiritual life. And we feel this now ourselves. How do we live a spiritual life? How do we live in community? How do we serve others? But the question that this particular monk asked, the abbot, was, well, if you go into ecstasy in meditation and the bell rings for communal service or you know, some other aspect of the monastic life, what is it that you do? And the monk told him, I mean, the abbot told him, when God gives you ecstasy, that is where you stay. It is your duty to stay in God contact. That is the higher duty. So it, it reminds me of a story when I first started to uh, work at the church, Ananta was my boss at that time. And he told me one piece of advice. He said, if you go into samadhi, you can have the day off. <laughs> Alas, I have not had any days off. I am still looking forward to the time where I can say, hey, I went into samadhi, I get a day off. <laughs> and of course, I imagine when you go into samadhi, what happens then is you have a higher duty, which is to share the blessings of that with all. And so it's one of those little win some, lose some kinds of perspectives. You just go to a different plane. But what a, what a wonderful challenge to have. <laughs> but this inner kingdom and the idea of the eternal Esvata tree with its roots above and its branches below. I just love mystical um, teachings. It's like, what? The roots above and the branches below. But the roots are the brain and the emanations of the brain, and the branches are, is the um, nervous system going down into the senses. And as um, Sandy read, when you bring your energy inward and upward flows the sap, the energy of the tree. And Victoria is telling me because of all my clapping that I'm losing a piece of me. <laughs> the little energizer bunny's going away. I'll put it back on in a minute. But <laughs> but the sap rises in God contact. And when we get pulled into delusion, into the world, the sap flows back downward again. 
And so this eternal tree is the spine. In the Garden of Eden is within you. God is within you. God is talking about the subtle rise and fall of energy in our spine as we try to lift our energy to the point between the eyebrows, to the point of the spiritual gate. Um, Ezekiel had a vision of this experience after a deep meditation. And the way he describes it is afterwards, the Lord brought me to the gate, even the gate that leads to the east. And behold, the glory of God came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. There's a lot of subtle things in there. The gate to the east, even the gate to the east. Well, the gate to the east is the spiritual eye. So lifting that energy through all the different spinal chakras to the spiritual eye and gazing eastward towards the light of God. And in that experience, as the choir sang about today, he heard the noise of many waters, the sound of Om, the sound, the vibratory sound of all creation. And he experienced the light of God the light of God shining through the earth. And of course, that light of God shines through all of us. And sound and light are two of the ways that we can experience God contact in meditation. And don't worry if you don't have any of these experiences at this point. Remember the dire fears and colossal suffering that you'll be saved from by just trying. So just try, see what happens. Maybe one day we'll have an experience like Ezekiel and we'll go, ooh, that was cool. But meanwhile, we have to be aware of our options and our choices. And part of the challenge, I think, is that we really don't know. We don't know ourselves, most of us, what it means to truly have cosmic consciousness, to truly have God's contact. And so I wanted to read from the autobiography of a yogi because Yogananda's words are far more um, meaningful, read directly in this, and I can't possibly present the experience of cosmic consciousness in the same way as he describes it. Um, And so this is just a little something that we can look forward to. And this story happens... Um, Yogananda had recently um, run away from the ashram. He was in search of God in the Himalayas, and eventually, brokenheartedly, he did not find God there. So shamefacedly, he says, he returned to his guru, Sri Yateshwar, in the ashram. And a day or two later, he was meditating. And Yateshwar called him, Mukunda, Yogananda's name as a young man, come down here. Mukunda ignored him. Mukunda, come down here. Sir, I am meditating. Nyuteshwar says, I know how you are meditating, Mukunda. Your thoughts are like leaves in a wind. Come down here. And so Yogananda does, stands before his guru. (laughs) And then the guru says something. And he says, your heart's desire will be fulfilled. And then what he did is he struck Yogananda gently on the chest. And now I'm going to read. My body became immovably rooted. Breath was drawn out of my lungs as if by some huge magnet. Soul and mind instantly lost their physical bondage and streamed out like fluid piercing light from my every pore. The flesh was as though dead, yet in my intense awareness, I knew that never before had I been fully alive. My sense of identity was no longer narrowly confined to a body, but embraced the circumambulant atoms. People on distant streets seemed to be moving gently over my own remote periphery. The roots of the plants and trees appeared through dim transparency of the soil. 
I discern the inward flow of their sap. All objects within my panoramic gaze trembled and vibrated like quick motion pictures. My body masters the pillared courtyard, the furniture and floor, the trees and sunshine occasionally became violently agitated until all melted into a luminescent sea. Even as sugar crystals thrown into a glass of water dissolve after being shaken. The unifying light alternated with materializations of form, the metamorphoses revealing the law of cause and effect in the creation. An oceanic joy broke upon calm, endless shores of my soul. The spirit of God, I realized, is exhaustless bliss. His body is countless tissues of light. I cognize the center of the Imperium as a point of intuitive perception in my heart. The creative voice of God I heard resounding is Om, the vibration of the cosmic motor. Suddenly, the breath returned to my lungs. With a disappointment almost unbearable, I realized that my infinite immensity was lost. Once more, I was limited to the humiliating cage of a body, not easily accommodative to spirit. Like a prodigal child, I had run away from my macrocosmic home and imprisoned myself in a narrow microcosm. I love the part about the oceanic joy breaking upon the endless shores of my soul as exhaustless bliss, the Spirit of God. But this experience, for many of us, is different than what we perceive and how we view the world, how we interact with the world. But it is a possibility. And so when you get an aspect of inexhaustible bliss touching your heart, uplifting your soul, grab a hold and stay firmly with that feeling, with that experience. Dedicate yourselves to finding that. The great ones tell us to be still and know. Know what? Know that God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you, 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 every you, all of us. The kingdom of God. Be still and know. <laughs>